Welcome back to another LP Gallery tutorial. Today, we're going to be talking about how to get control of that gradient fill tool. Sometimes that tool poses a problem for people because they can't quite figure out how it all works. So here we're going to show you how it works. So we have all these topics to cover, and I'm going to check them off as we finish them. So in case you want to go forward as a backwards to the tutorial, you can just look for the check marks. Okay, so here we have two rows of rounded rectangles with gradient fills. Now this is a striped gradient fill. We're not going to talk about how to create that here. I have another video to show you if you want to turn your gradients into stripes, how to do that. But quite often it's easier to see what's happening here than it is with a typical gradient. So if I click on this one here, which is your typical gradient, you can see here that we have a lot of gradients used here. The maximum number of stops you can actually use in a gradient is 10, and all 10 are being used right here. They're all being used here too. All 10 stops are being used here, but they're being used in a different way. So here's your typical gradient. We've got 10 stops, maximum number you can use, and we're going from a dark red all the way to the purple. So let's take a look. So here we have a linear. A linear is a up and down, left to right, corner to corner blending. So you can see that it either goes this way, this way, or it'll go rotate to any corner. So basically, things are happening in stripes. This one here is a radial blend. So a radial blend is a center out blend. So you can see we're centering out. And because you can see that we've got distinct colors, it's clear to see the banding in here. Okay? So a center radiates from the center out. So what happens is, in this case, the first color is all the way to the left, so it's right here. And in the case of the radial, the first color here is right at the center. So it blends this way out. So it's going from this way to that way. So in other words, it's going from here to here blending out. Okay, so the center color is the one to the left. And here you can see the darker color is the one to the left. The radial can also blend by corners. So you can do all four corners. You can just get a corner blend. And we'll show you that later. Now the rectangle blend is kind of like the radial blend, except instead of going round, you're going to go in rectangles like this. So you can see that's happening there. So once again, all the way to the left, the left color here is the center color, and it blends out to the far color, okay? And you can see that here. So here we got a rectangle kind of blend going from the center out. And again, you can do all four corners in these blends. The path is a little different. I've used rounded rectangles for a very specific purpose. The path sometimes looks the same as rectangular, but if you look here, and if you look at the fill, you can see that it is going rounded. It is following the shape of the objects. In other words, it's following the path of the object. So that's why you get that, and you can see it right here. But again, it's going from the center out. Now, just to make sure you understand about path, I'm going to grab these two, and I'm going to just change their shape to make sure you really understand how the path works. So let me try something like um, a round shape. So we go to an oval shape, and you can clearly see how the path makes the blend follow its shape. Now, the path doesn't work with all these drawing shapes. For example, if I were to go to, let's say, an arrow shape, you're not going to get that. It's going to default to the radial. So whenever you use a shape and the fill does not follow the path but defaults to the radial, you know that the path fill will not work with that shape. So, so it works with a lot of shapes, but not all of them. And it's uh, kind of a hit and miss. So, for example, if we take a complex shape like a star, it will work fine with the star. So, again, it's a hit and miss whether this path will follow the path of a shape. So you're just going to have to try it and see what works and what doesn't work. So here I have a rounded rectangle, and I have just three color stops. You have the red, the yellow, and the blue. Now, this is how the stops work. These colors were just taken from the default palette of these. These are pure colors. So this is pure blue pure yellow, and pure red. So right at the stop itself, the color is pure. It's pure yellow here, pure blue, and pure red here. But between here to here, we're starting to get a blend. So this is red, nice solid red. The stripe in the middle here is solid yellow, and this one here is solid blue. Between the stripes, we start blending. So you can see we get an equal blend. Between the red to yellow, you get an equal blend. So the red starts bleeding into the yellow, and you get orange here. So it's an equal blend between here to here and from here to here. That's how it works. So it does an equal blend. The stop itself, if you choose it from one of these, these are pure colors, will stay at that specific color. So you got a pure color right here in the middle, and then 
and blend it right here. Pure color at the edge, pure color at the edge, and the rest are all blended. So the pure color is only directly where the stop is. The rest is all blended color. Now the number of stops you add will do the same thing. You add another stop here and make it a different color, it'll blend there. But the stop itself will be the color you chose. So that's basically how the stops are blended. The colors are blended equally between the two, but the stop will retain its pure color. Okay, and the next step is to start adding and removing our stops and moving them around. So to make sure you understand how the blending works, what I'm going to do is add another stop here. Now to add stops, you could use the add or remove stops here, or you can just click on the color ramp. I prefer to click on the color ramp, so I'm going to just click on the color ramp. And what I'm going to do is make that one a pure yellow like this. So I'm going to click here, and I'm going to make it a pure yellow. And then I'm going to just move these apart. Okay, so what you have here is still a blending, but it goes from pure yellow to pure yellow. So you can see we have a solid band of yellow, and the blending is right here. From yellow to blue, we get green here. And yellow to red, we get orange here. So we have a stronger solid band of yellow here, just because these are pure yellow. Just to make sure you understand that these two stops are actually blending just the pure yellow, I'm going to click in the middle, and I'm going to take a look at that color. So if I look at that color, you'll see it's a pure yellow. When you have two stops of the exact same color and you spread them apart, that color stays pure while the rest is blended. Okay, so now I'm going to take this one and I'm going to make it a different color. So let's say I make it a purple color. And you can see how that changes. So from purple to blue, we have a blending. From purple to yellow, we have a blending. And from yellow to red, we have the blending. And you get something that looks like this. And again, moving the stop. So when I move the purple towards the blue, you can see that there's very little blending here, but much longer blending between the purple and the yellow. So there's always going to be a blending between the stops. Now, if I wanted, say, an in-between color, let's say I wanted a color like here. I like the purple to blue here, and I want this purpley blue. All I have to do is click in that spot. And PowerPoint looks where my arrow is touching, and it gives me the color at that spot. So let's take a look at it. Let's see what it looks like. And it kind of looks like this. So it's chosen a color in between, and it's an in-between color between the purple and blue. So if you want to add in-between colors these two, it's just a matter of going to the ramp and clicking on it. It will find that color right at that point and make it that color. So if I were to do the same thing here, let's say I wanted an in-between color, I would click at that point. It would give me an in-between color. Now if we look at that, it's an in-between color between the yellow and the purple. And if we do the same thing here, we'll click right there. We get kind of an orange. So if I look at that, I'm getting an in-between color between the red and the yellow. So there's an orange right there. So that's how it works. So if you click on the ramp between two colors, whatever you touch there, you're going to get that blended color. So that's a little bit about how the ramp works. There's always going to be blending between two stops. The pure color that you selected, if you add your own specific color to it, then that color is only at the stop point itself. Now I've set this back to red, yellow, and blue. Moving stops, you can either drag them at free will like this, or you can dial them if you want to go to a specific uh, percentage. So this is 0, this is 100, and of course it is whatever it is between. So I want to set this one to 50%. So I either I can spin it down or I could drag and type 50%. Changing stop positions. Sometimes this happens and you don't actually mean that to happen. If I click here and I drag the red one past the yellow one, then I will reverse the colors. So now the yellow is at the zero position. That makes it the first color. So the red is now in the middle and we still have the blue. So you can switch your colors if you have to do that. And sometimes you may want to do that. When you drag and switch colors, they change positions, just like you see here. Okay? So you, again, you can drag the stop anywhere on the ramp. You can dial it anywhere on the ramp you want. But if you flip their positions, they will change colors. So you have to be aware of that. So be careful about flipping their positions unless you actually intend to. I'll just drag that back, and I'm going to take that to the middle, and I'll dial it to 50%. Okay, so 100% is the one to the right. This one is dialed at 50% in the middle, and this one is set at 0%. Now, you can also extend a color's range. So, for example, let's say in this blend I have here, I want more of a solid blue. 
If I want that, I would take the blue stop and just drag it towards the yellow. And when I do that, you'll see I get a solid blue. So everything between here to here is a solid blue. And I'm going to click on that just to show you. And you can see it's the same solid blue. So that is a pure color. So anything from here to here will be pure color. Now if I do the same with the red and I drag it out, once again it's the same thing. From this stop to the edge is pure red. So you can see what's happening here. The blending is happening in the middle. So the yellow is still pure yellow, only at this point we get a smaller blending here, a smaller blending there. So you get this. You get almost like a stripe in the middle. So even with your gradients, you can have solid color areas within a gradient like you see there. So let me just put this back. Let me put this one back. And let me do the same with the yellow. So if I were to drag the yellow more to the red, you're going to see that I'm getting a lot longer uh, gradient of yellow before it starts really blending into the blue. So you get a lot of yellow here, and it blends into the blue. And if I reverse it, if I drag it all the way here, we get it reversed. So we get a lot of yellow blending into the red, so we get a nice equal blending here. But again, the pure yellow is only here. So you can drag your stops around like you see there. And you can have more solid colors by dragging the edges. So you can drag the yellow, the center one, all over to the red, for example, to get more orange. Or you can take the yellow, drag it to blue to get more of a green blend in there. What if I wanted a solid yellow band here? A really solid yellow band right in the middle. To do that, I would have to click on the stop. And I would have to change that to a yellow. Now once I've done that, and I stretch these apart, you can see once again, we're getting a solid yellow. So again, this is a solid yellow. So if I click here to show you again, you'll see that it's a pure yellow. So if you need a strong, solid band of color there, that's how you would do it. And you would just stretch these, and the band of color, solid band, gets uh, wider and wider. So let me put these like this. And now let me grab the red and bring it closer in. And let me bring the blue closer in there. Now we have more of a solid blue, solid red, solid yellow, and just a little bit of blending in there. So this gradient tool, you can blend in many, many different ways, get many different patterns, and you can probably kind of figure out how the stripe one is going to be working. So again, if you're interested in doing solid stripes and gradients, you can catch our video on that. So there it is. With the gradient tool, you can get pure blending, or you can get long, solid stripes of blending. You get uh, thin blending, large blending. So you get all kinds of ways to merge and blend these colors together. Next step is to make your color darker or lighter. So here I've got a nice little like first prize ribbon. Now we've got a video showing you how to create these ribbon type of clip arts. You can check that out. Most of this is done by just making the color darker to give you the shadows. So I'm going to show you that here. So let's say I wanted the blue to be darker. There's two ways to do it. I can select the blue, go to my more colors, and I can drag this down here. Okay, that'll make it dark. Or I can just do that here where this says brightness, which is basically the same thing. So if I drag it here, you can see that it's getting darker, or I can drag it here to make it lighter. So you have two ways to darken a color. And this is a darkening color without having to add another color. Like I don't want to make it another really dark blue. I just want to darken that color so you get that blending. Now there is a major advantage to dragging it here as opposed to going here and into the more colors. There is a major advantage, and we won't talk about that here. But if you follow our video on how to make quick color changes to your objects, you'll see there's a major advantage to darkening your colors through this way rather than going to the more colors. And here's what I'm going to show you. So here we have a nice blue ribbon, and I'm going to go and make quick color changes to this just by going to my design. I'm going to go to my colors, and I'm going to change my theme colors. So you can see what I'm talking about, how to make quick color changes to your objects. Okay, So we're going to talk about that in another video. And if you stick to darkening and lighting your colors through here, then they will also shift in here too. If you go to more colors, you go here to more colors and change your colors, they will not change in the method we're going to show you in the other video. So there is an advantage to uh, just doing it here. First of all, it's faster. If you're going to just drag it down, you might as well just drag it down here. So it's a lot faster to just drag it this way, sideways, and rather going up and down. Now let's take a look at this ribbon here. Okay, so I'm going to click on one of these objects. You can see that I've got a dark blue, light blue, and dark blue. Okay, so 
all I have to do is actually take this blue here, and it's part of the color theme here. I made, I took this blue, and all I did was drag it darker. And so that gives me the shadow. So quite often when you're dragging colors lighter or darker, you're using them for highlights and shadows. So that's where it's really going to come in, is when you're trying to do highlights and shadows. Now the gold is done the same way. You can see we have gold here. All the gold is, again, it's the uh, dark gold here. The dark gold is nothing more than this gold that's made darker. So again, so we can follow the same thing. So when you're doing something like this, where we have a, a dark blue shadow and we have a gold reflective shadow, we want the gold reflective shadow to follow the blue. So it's very easy to do it this way, where you just choose your theme colors and then you just darken and lighten them by the slider bar rather than trying to add more colors that are darker or lighter. The next step is to show you how to make stops transparent. So I'm going to take this yellow one and I'm going to make it transparent. So I've got it selected and I'm going to drag my transparency slider. If it goes all the way to 100%, it's transparent. And because it's transparent, we can see the red circle hiding behind it. So the transparency acts like a fill. So between the yellow to blue, you can see we have transparency. So the transparency replaces the yellow and it acts as the same kind of a gradient. So it is a blending to the blue. So we've got pure transparent right here. And then we have the soft blending of the transparency to the solid blue. And then the same thing here to the solid red. So we've got pure transparency here and then semi-transparency until we get to the solid end stops here. If you wanted to have more of a solid center transparent, you would add another stop. Now it could be any color, but I prefer to use the same color originally was and drag the transparency. Now once you separate these out, you get something that looks like that. So again, the transparency will act similar to a gradient fill. So as you add that transparency, it will blend in the same way that the gradients blend. Now in this one here, I'm going to click here. I have a black to white gradient. So we're going to use a, a vignette. So I have a picture behind this, and I want the white to disappear so the picture shows through. So again, I just take my white stop, and I drag it to the transparency, and I get something like that. Now, that's not too bad, but it doesn't really look like a vignette. It kind of just looks like a square that's semi-opaque. So what I do is I can take my black, and I can bring the black slider in more like this. So the influence is stronger here, so this is solid black. But it's kind of fuzzy. It doesn't look clear. I'd like that picture to be pure transparency or not a fuzzy thing. So what I'm going to do with this is I'm going to drag that closer up. So I drag it more to the black, and you can see what's happening. Because this is all transparent, the actual um, gradient is only happening in the middle, and we get something like this. So this is an easy way to do a vignette, and this is probably one of the most common uses for a transparency. Now, if I really wanted a sharp edge, I didn't want this sharp soft edge here all I gotta do is bring these closer together so let's say this one here is at 70 percent I'll take this and I'll bring it to about 69 percent so if I spin it up to about 69 you'll see we'll get a fairly close edge I can do it one more but sometimes they flip like this sometimes they'll just flip the way there is ways to fix that but it's easier if you just uh, leave it to one percent difference so if you want a really sharp outline that's how you do it there you have a vignette so again we can have a soft one we can have a very strong one. So transparency stops are used very much for things like this, but they're also used for adding blending like shadows and highlight. So here we have an example of a nice shiny bell. If you're interested in making something like this, we have a video just showing you how to create nice little bells like this. Now what really makes the bell is the reflection. That's these shapes. So I'm going to click on the shape. And you can see that it's going white to white, except that this stop here is purely transparent. Now, if I remove that, you'll see it doesn't look very reflective. So it's the shape that's making the reflection. And what's happening here is I'm using the transparency slider to move that there to get more or less of the reflections. So transparency stops are very often used to create reflections and shadows on objects where you want something to go from one color and to blend right into the other color. So again, another use for transparency stops. If you've never tried them, you might want to give them a try. And just remember that how they work, that they act like a gradient color, except they apply transparency rather than the color. Now I didn't talk about the different directions the gradients 
would take when we did the four types of gradients because I'm saving it for the last part here because sometimes the rotation of the gradient gets confusing as to which way the gradient is actually flowing. So we'll do this, the different uh, directions, along with the idea of rotating a gradient so you get a clear understanding of how this works. Let's start off with this. When you draw an object, the rotation handle always represents the top, always. So if you do a linear blend, we have a linear blend, and you change your angle to zero, then you have a left to right blending, exactly as you see it here. Okay, so the red is to the left, the blue is to the right. A zero angle on a linear blend represents your color ramp perfectly. Quite often, if you're doing a linear blend and you rotate an object and you got confused about what you're going, you can set this back to zero and that will help you balance what's going on. So let's see how this works. Linear blend set to zero. We have red, yellow, and green. So let's change our direction. Now here's what people don't understand. No matter whether you take the radio or the square, what you're seeing here are directions, and these are always the top. You, you can imagine the rotation handle at the top here, because this is what it's showing you. This is always the top. No matter how you rotate your object, this represents the top. These do not rotate. When you rotate your objects, these stay in the same position. So they're always showing you the top. So for example, here I have the red going to the left. So let's say I want the red to the top. So it's telling me because I'm going, I've got a zero angle here and it's following left to right, to rotate it to the top, I would just click that because my rotation handle the top. So I want the red at the top, so I click that, the red goes to the top, and so forth. So if I want the red to this bottom right corner, I would click here. It's telling me rotation handle is up here, so there's my rotation handle. So if I want it to the red, it's pretty plain, it'll just do it that way. So remember, when you're clicking the direction, this always represents the top. This part always represents the top, regardless of how you rotated that. So I want to put it back to my zero angle. Okay, so next let's take a look and we'll look at the other blends. So let's take a look at radial. So it's the same thing. This represents the top. So if I want the center blend, I would click there. And if I click here, I want it going to the top right. This is the top. My handle's to the top, so I know that this will point it to the right and so forth. Now, let's try this rectangular blend. It's the same thing. Let's go to the center. Now, again, my rotational handle at the top. So this is a pretty straightforward way. So if I wanted to, let's say, the red going to the top left, my handle's here. It's matching that. So I know if I click here, it will go top left. And that's basically how that works. So we kind of get that idea. And the path, of course, only has one following. Either works or it doesn't work, and that's it. There's no rotation to the path or anything like that. Okay, so let's put it back to linear. I want to put it back to my red, I can actually just go zero here, and I have it that way. Now what happens when I rotate it? This is where the confusion comes in for a lot of people. So now I'm going to rotate this. Let's say I rotate it this way. This is still the top. Where my rotation handle is, is still the top. So I've rotated this. This looks like the top, but it's just the left pointing to the top. This is still the top of the object. This is still the right of the object. This is the bottom of the object and that's the left of the object. Okay, so now what happens if I want the red to be at the top? So I click here, and remember, this is telling me that this is the top. So if I want my red to be at the top, I have rotated it. So where is the red gonna be? Right there. So again, this is the top. So let's say I want this corner. This represents the top, and I want it to go, it'll go to this corner. And I want that corner, but I rotate it. I'm kind of confused. I just got to remember. So this is my top. I want it to go to that corner. So it's this one. And it goes to that corner. Okay. So I hope that's a little clear. So let's say I want it to go to the bottom. Okay. So here's my top. I want the red at the bottom. So I click here. The red goes to that side. So let's go and try a different one. Let's go to a radial. Let's put it back uh, in the center. Let's click here. If I want the red to go here, this represents the top. Even though I rotate it, what am I clicking? Here. All I got to do is look where the top is. So the top is there. So if I wanted to go to the bottom, the bottom left, this is the top. This is the top. I want to go there. I would click on this one. Looks reverse, but that's what you got. You just got to remember where the rotation handle, that is always the top. So regardless of what you do here, regardless of which ones you choose, 
Just remember where the rotation handle, because that is always the top. So again, here's your rectangle. Let's say I want it to go here. I want to go to red to be here. Where's my top? I want it to go here. This represents the right. That represents the right. That's still the top. I just click there, and I get that. So if you get confused, that's basically how it works. It's always in relationship to the top. And you can always dial it back to zero, especially with the linear, if you get confused. And the same way you use this. This is always in relationship. When you rotate this, this is always in relationship to the top. What if you don't want the gradient to rotate at all? No matter what direction you rotate this in, you want to keep the gradient going the way you had it. So let's say I want the gradient going red, yellow, blue. Regardless of how I rotate it, I always want to go left to right. Then you would uncheck this, rotate with shape. If you do that, it doesn't matter how you rotate it. Generally, we usually have the gradient rotate with the object, but there may be a time that you don't actually want it to happen. Okay, the next step is this. When you choose the preset gradients like these, sometimes you get confused. So I'm going to click on this one, and you can see that we've got a preset, and it's already applied an angle to it. So we got a 270 degree angle to this. And uh, sometimes it gets a little confusing. Let's say I want this to go, I want this blue to be here. I want my dark blue to light blue. So how am I going to do this? Well, we, have, we haven't rotated this. So this is the top. So in order for this to be here, we have to go back to zero. So you go back to zero and you get that. Okay, so if you use a preset gradient, there's usually a direction applied to it, so you might get a little confused. Now, just take my word for it. If you're using a linear, it's a lot easier to set the linear back to zero so that this blend follows that blend. So I hope this tutorial helped you with your gradients. So if it did, check out our other tutorials. We have a lot of tutorials on how to create a lot of PowerPoint clip art. Uh, shapes where you use a lot of gradients as transparencies for shadows and highlights and we teach you how to do very complex looking clip art objects very simply thank you for watching and we'll catch you on the next video